And I'm gonna do this in two parts. There's gonna be a brief back. I'm gonna give you guys a brief back background on the lean system uh, so that we have a conceptual starting point and, and you know kind of how we're, how we're thinking about our planning. And then I'm gonna go over four lean concepts for crop planning. And these are concepts that we use every growing season. Uh, I'm in my 15th year of growing food for a living. Uh, I've been doing it 10, 10 years as a full-time living, uh, meaning we haven't had uh, major off-farm income. And uh, I've been doing this lean stuff for about seven years. So these are concepts that I've got some experience with. Experience with and you know, the concepts that I appreciate more and more are every growing season. Uh, they're very powerful concepts, and they're the reason that we're able to do this for a living. Okay, so uh, essentially, uh, lean is a system that was born in manufacturing, and Toyota in particular is credited uh, with inventing the system. And uh, essentially, what Toyota was able to do was use this just-in-time system, uh, where they did small batch uh, manufacturing, and they shot uh, well past, very quickly past their mass production competition. Okay, Henry Ford said he's able to produce any Model T that his customers will want as long as it's the color black. And Toyota said, we're going to produce any car you will, you want, you want, and you can choose the color. Okay, so in, uh, in a nutshell, oh, here's how Toyota did it. Here's how, here's how they become, here's how they became the world's number one uh, manufacturer, automobile manufacturer. First, they got super organized with this beautiful system called 5S. And we could have a whole webinar session on organization. However, the, the nut and bolts of it is that you wanted to be ruthless and get rid of anything non-essential on your property. Anything you're not using on a weekly basis to add value for your customer, you shouldn't be tripping over it or looking at it. It should be off the, it should be off the property. And uh, so we actually farm with very few tools. And number two, and we're going to talk a bit more about this tonight, is precisely identified by team. And they want to step, uh, they went two or three steps beyond their competition. And they got this information from their customers, okay? And I say be parking lot observers, and I'm going to explain that concept uh, in a few minutes. And the third step is cut out the muda. And muda is a term, and uh, very broadly speaking, means waste. And in English, we just have one term for waste, and muda is a more complicated concept. However, it's anything you're doing that's not in the service of adding value for your customer, okay? So according to Lean, you're either doing a value adding activity or you're contributing to muda. And there's no gray area in the middle. You're either adding value for the customer or you're contributing to muda. And much of what the Lean system is about is being, being honest with yourself and, and, and telling yourself, hey, we are contributing Muda here or we're adding value here. And it takes some time to parse out those two. And I won't have a lot of time to get into that tonight. However, I will say that according to lean thinking, uh, everything we're talking about tonight is Muda. Okay, this is all waste. Uh, the time you spend uh, in front of your computer putting spreadsheets together is time that's taken away from seeding. From harvesting, from 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 washing food, from delivering food to your customer, okay. Your customer is not paying you. Customer is not going to pay you to sit down and create a beautiful spreadsheet, okay. And so we want to be efficient about our planning, and and uh, so I want to say that at the beginning that what the system I'm lining out here and the system we use shouldn't take you more than about an afternoon to do. You don't want to spend a lot of time planning out the year. And uh, you certainly don't want to spend uh, several weeks or, or months, which I admit was our practice at the be beginning. We spent a long time planning at beautiful spreadsheets. And in reality, we planned way more than we would have needed to. And once we leaned up our planning, we actually were able to have time to do some winter production. And then the last step is Kai's and our continuous improvement. And essentially, uh, what Toyota said is we're going to practice these first, uh, for, we're going to do these first three practices with even more precision every, every year. So they're going to get even more, more organized every year. They're going to get to know their customers at a deeper level every year. And they're going to cut out more of, the, more of the waste every year. So on a farm, you can do this too. Uh, and you become leaner every season. And it's, in essence, what, 
uh, teaching owner who was at Toyota, helped develop systems at Toyota. Uh, in essence, he said, really all we're doing is looking at the timeline from a moment the customer gives us an order to the point when we collect the cash. And we're reducing the timeline, we're removing the non-value added waste, okay? And so it's not a complicated concept, not a complicated system. And it essentially boils down to this, lean's about getting better. Uh, it's about wasting, wasting less and getting more precise on value, understanding your customers at a more precise, uh, more precisely than your competition. It's about doing those things rather than getting bigger every year. And that's how you grow as a business. So you don't have to physically get bigger. You don't have to build more greenhouses or uh, go from five acres to 10 acres to 20 acres uh, to become more profitable, okay? You can choose to be a small size. I, I'm a big believer that small is a very beautiful thing. You can choose the right size for your business, uh, the size that you feel comfortable with, the number of people you wanna work around or how many acres that you wanna manage. You can choose that right size that feels comfortable and you can become more profitable every year using some lean thinking. Okay, so uh, seven types of, uh, uh, this list is at the center of our farm. And so I'm just gonna uh, show you the list here. I don't have time this evening to go or reach them. However, really the whole gist of lean system uh, boils down to noticing the waste and getting rid of them. And as we go, as I, as I show you through our planning process, I'm gonna refer back to uh, these types of waste, overproduction, uh, waiting waste. The waste of transportation, driving too much, too many holding places, over-processing, uh, inventory waste, having too many seeds on hand, too many supplies on hand, uh, waste of motion, uh, and other people or products are moving around your farm too much, and, and then finally making defective products. Um, and I would add in here, uh, 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 creating shrink, which is an industry term, the produce business for food that comes home unsold. So you've, you've grown it, you, uh, you seeded it, you watered it, you tended it, you harvested it, you washed it, you packaged, you delivered to your customer, and it comes home as an unsold product. Okay, there's nothing that'll kill your farm faster uh, than shrink. So you really have to keep an eye on that. Let me just go over these four, uh, um, what we're gonna go over tonight. So number one is develop pool systems. And this is as opposed to push systems. I'll go over the difference between those two. Number two, is to simplify your systems every season. This includes your planning processes. Third tip, practice load leveling. The term in, in lean speak is hijunga. And the fourth tip is be nimble. And a term that's it's popular in lean circles now is agile, agility, instead of being rigid as a business. And especially this is really important in the planning stages. And so let me explain these concepts and I'll show you how we use these concepts um, as we plan. Okay, so developing pool systems essentially amounts to this. You begin with the customer and you work backwards from there. So the customer is absolutely paramount in the lean system, absolutely paramount in figuring out what is value and what is muda. It's up to the customer to determine those two. So we really have to understand our customers and develop our business, develop our growing system around what the customers want. So here's an illustration I like to use. Lean pool is like a vending machine. So your customer is pooling products and you're replenishing those products. And the word replenishment is very popular in the lean, lean, lean language. And so in a farm context, uh, you almost wanna feel your customer coming out and harvesting your crop for you. Okay, you want pool systems. And so if you're gonna uh, start a fudge making business, okay, uh, and you're, if you're gonna use the push system to grow, uh, or not to grow fudge, but to make and sell fudge, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go out and buy your chocolate and your sugar and your, all the other ingredients that go into making fudge. And you're gonna make the kind of fudge that you think maybe your customers will buy. And then you're gonna go around town and try to push that fudge on all your customers. Okay, so you go to the grocery stores, the co-op, you'll buy a booth, get a rent a booth at a farmer's market. And you'll try to sell that fudge by pushing it. Okay, that's called push system. There's a, there's a lot of push system marketing in the U.S. A lot of uh, a lot of advertising, a lot of businesses structure themselves around a push system. What Lean says is you want a pool system, and essentially, in, a, in this using this fudge amount, you know, you know, you would do just the opposite. You would go to a, your farmer's market and run a table for a week or two and just talk to customers. 
What kind of fudge might you want from me? What kind of quantities might you want? Uh, you would uh, go to your grocery store, try to get some orders for fudge and basically collect as many orders as you can. And then you go out and buy the, the butter and the sugar and everything you need to make precisely the right kind and the right amount of fudge and you have your customers hang up. And so some key points about uh, learning from your customers and developing these pool systems. First is you wanna lock your own assumptions away. Okay, you want to throw away the key, no guessing, and rely on actual information, surveying, interviewing, rather than conjecture. You don't want to get, it's amazing how wrong, uh, how wrong I have been about my own customers. Uh, you just have to ask them and get information from them. And then the best practice that Lean uses is this term, Genshi and Boots do, uh, which means close observation to thoroughly understand the situation. And so in our case, we have dinner uh, once a year at all of our restaurants. I like to go back and watch the chefs cook. I talk to a chef in person. I hang out in the co-op produce department. Uh, okay, it's close, direct observation. How is our food getting used? How is the customer valuing our food? And I'll give you just one story from Toyota. Uh, when, they, when it came time to redesign the OFI Toyota Sienna, they sent an engineer over to their primary market, which is Mexico, the US, and Canada. And they told that engineer to practice Genshi Gamboots too. In other words, observe how people in this market were using it, with using their mini plants. And he noticed uh, uh, in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, he went to Home Depot and he didn't go in. He just stood in the parking, parking lot. And he noticed that people were coming out with four by eight sheets of plywood or drywall or whatever. And they couldn't quite get it to fit in the vehicle. And he saw a lot of frustrated Americans uh, bungee in the back hatch or strapping drywall to the roof of their vans. And he phoned home and he said, we're going to have to get a four-way sheet of whatever into the next vehicle that we produce. And sure enough, if you own a, a minivan produced after that point in time, the likelihood is very high. You can get a four-way sheet of whatever or whatever. And so that's just an example of how Toyota went, went, went far beyond their competition to closely observe Genshin Butsu, how their customers, how we're using them their products. It's very powerful uh, practice. And what you want to do is look at these three boxes in the middle. You want to ask these questions. What do they want? When do they want it? And what's the amount they want? Okay, that's what amounts to value. Okay, what, product, what specific vegetables are they wanting? What kind of kale do they want? What shade of green do they want on their kale? Uh, what precise mix of tomatoes do they want in their tomato boxes? And when do they want it? Uh, what's the amount they want it in? And, what, and, and then finally, let's talk about price. And if we have time, we'll go over uh, how we set prices with the lean, with lean thinking. So we're constantly asking these three questions in one way or another of our customer in as, much, in as personal fashion as possible. And what it amounts to is this. You want to sell as much as you can, ideally more than 80%, before you, per, before you purchase seeds. Okay? So only one in five seeds on our farm, ideally, doesn't have a customer who's already lined up for that seed. Okay, and these might be extra costs. We do have a booth at a farmer's market where you can't always line, you know, get uh, pre-orders for, for things. So our most of the products, that we're, most of the crops we're gonna produce, uh, I've lined up customers. I'm doing that right, right now over the winter. We're getting our orders, if not our paycheck, in the winter time. And so we do this through what I call value sheets. This is one of the templates that I'm gonna give you in a need. So here's a very simple value sheet that we've used in the past. Okay, so we have a chef's name at the top. We ask, what do you, what do you want? Be specific. So on ball fennel, he tells me he wants the tops left on his ball fennel. He doesn't want any roots. He wants big, big frilly tops, so he'll use it. We have other customers, chefs, who want us to leave six inches of top on the ball fennel. We're going to do exactly what they want here. And then when does he want it delivered? Okay, and we live within a mile and a half of all of our customers, so we have the luxury of being able to deliver precisely when these chefs are wanting their food. And chefs, they usually want their stuff before 5 p.m. It's a, that's when rush hour happens. They prefer to get stuff uh, usually in the early afternoon. And then how much they want, how many uh, ball, balls of fennel is you gonna want on a weekly basis. And so this is, this is not an obligation to purchase. This is just giving me an indication of what's on the menu uh, for him and how can we supply what's on the menu. And it creates a pool system. Okay, here's a more, just a little bit more complicated value sheet that I'm currently using. 
And I'll share this with you too. And this is just a portion of it here. And the items on the left are the items that we produce. These are low cost of production items. Um, that I, I want to be able to produce as much as I can for our customers. And then I'm telling our chefs when they're, when they're most available from our farm. And then when do you want it? Range of months. Uh, how much do you want? And then we talk price uh, over on the right hand side. And I do charge different prices to different customers because a co-op is willing to pay more for colored peppers than a restaurant might be willing to, but a restaurant might be willing to pay more for bagged greens, uh, salad mix than a co-op might be willing to. And so we're, there's a constant price negotiation. We're gonna come up with precise prices for each of our, that work for each of our, our customers. And so, like I said, Genshin, this is a personal activity. Uh, we're gonna meet personally with our chefs and go over this information. And so here's an example of how uh, one chef and I filled out. Actually, this is a produce department at a co-op. Uh, and the level of, uh, 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 level of detail here and how we talked about price and how much he can go up to on price. And, um, and I can't stress enough that the more detailed you are here, uh, the more pool, the more stickiness your product will have, which means the harder it will be for your customers to keep their hands off your product. Okay, and so we do go out of our way. We've been over backwards to, to meet a lot of the needs of our, of our uh, particular needs of our customers. And then what I do is I can, can combine these sheets. So I'll have uh, five or eight restaurants uh, or wholesale accounts and, and we'll have our own CSA members and we'll have projections for what we might sell at a farmer's market. Then I put all that information in one sheet. Uh, which basically amounts to how many beds, how many growing, how much growing surface am I going to need to devote to fill the orders that have come in? Okay, and this can get sort of complicated uh, because if someone says they need 50 pounds of red beets, how do you know how many beds to devote to red beets to fill that order? And it just simply it takes uh, you have to have an experience to really get a handle, uh, a handle. It, However, I did put a sheet together here that we do use here that tells uh, the amount of volume for each of our products that we can get out of 100 square feet. And so just take whatever bed size you're using and do a little math and you can figure, figure out about how many beds you need for, uh, let's say a customer wants a 100, uh, wants a, um, 100 pounds of ginger, for instance. So we can see on the list, we're gonna need to devote about a 10 foot by 10 foot space, 100 square feet to get that ginger for uh, the customers or head lettuce. We can get 250 heads of lettuce in 100 square feet. And so uh, having this chart here helps us make sure that we plan and plant precisely the right amount, okay? I, I mentioned the waste, the seven types of waste and overproduction is first on the list for a good reason. A lot of farmers aren't, uh, taking the time to precisely plant. Okay, we're usually planting too much. And the USDA tells us 20% of fresh fruits and vegetables are never even harvested. Uh, and that's just farmers going out there planting willy-nilly and not specifically according to the orders that they've collected. And then I want to mention this too. We even survey customers to determine their preferred communication method. Okay, and this all adds, like I said, stickiness. Do they want text? Do they want phone calls? How do they want us to communicate with them? And when do they want their phone calls and text? And the last point I'm gonna mention here, and then I'm gonna open up the questions, is the customer's the only one who's allowed to define value here. And so you might have a fascination with tractors or greenhouse interventions, implements, and I do, and I'm guilty of all of these all the time. That's why I list them here. How are the customers the only one who should drive your farming decisions, okay? Uh, product fascination. I love. I used to love to grow these Asian noodle beans, these, these, these uh, yard-long red things. And however, we just didn't have customer de demand. We didn't have pool for them. And I was. It, it'll kill your business. You don't have time to be pushing uh, exotic products. Uh, process fascination. Uh, rooftop gardening, LED systems, uh, vertical growing systems. Even this afternoon, I was researching uh, some of the new LED technologies out there. is amazing. However, I can't let that fascination get ahead of my customers. The customer and what they want, when they want it, how much, that has to really lead my decision making. And any technology I choose to use has to back up what the customers want. Tip number two, and uh, is you wanna simplify your growing systems every season. And this includes your planning systems. 
And so, like I just got done saying, focus on new growers or even seasoned growers. I do this. Find your five lowest cost production winners. So these are five crops uh, that you know you can produce a steady high, that have a steady and high volume demand, that have a local demand, so you're not driving to Los Angeles, Chicago, or wherever uh, to deliver the food, and that are easy for you to produce, easy and low cost to produce, okay? So these are your focus crops. These are the crops you're gonna make the most money, money on. And I list them on the left, on the side here, are the ones that are the winners on our farm. Consistently, tomatoes, kale, baby greens. They're very low cost of production because these are all crops that you do one time seeding or transplanting, and then you get multiple harvest off of, okay? So compare kale to a head lettuce, for instance. You plant kale once, and I've, I've, I've logged as many as 20 harvests off of a kale plant that I transplanted, okay? Compare that to head, head lettuce, you're gonna get one harvest off of head lettuce. So I'm gonna focus on those crops and I'm getting multiple harvest off of. So for me, those are my lowest cost production crops. And then uh, I've developed efficient systems for carrots and, and then uh, we've got a strong local market for hot dry turnips. So we're gonna focus on these crops that are easy for me to produce, local demand, and a lot of high volume, I can produce them in a higher volume than I can my other, other crops. Okay, so here's a kale, a picture of kale um, that we're gonna harvest over and over and over again. There's some carrots in the background. Um, and, and lettuce too, we can, uh, I still har I do hand harvesting on my lettuce because I want to get to that sixth or eighth harvest. Uh, that's where the true money is. Uh, those are, that's, that's free, free money. You've already planted it and you, you paid for your expenses to your first couple harvests. And then once you get beyond three or four harvests, you're making true, it's easy money. Okay, and so like I said, you wanna overdevelop markets and then choose the chefs or uh, wholesale accounts who are uh, closest to home, pay on a regular basis, put consistent orders in. And uh, here are some metrics we use on our farm. And I just wanna talk about the, the bottom two. So Lean encourages metrics and simple metrics instead of complicated record keeping. And this session isn't on uh, record keeping, however, these two relate to planning because we're gonna choose crops. We're gonna choose to offer crops and focus crops uh, that have a fuel to cooler time of $100 an hour. And this means we can harvest and package a crop at a rate of $100 an hour or more, or we're not gonna produce it, or we're gonna redesign our system so we get to that point. And then the same with our selling activities. We're, we need to be able to, from the point at which our van leaves the property to the point at which it comes home, could we sell $100 an hour worth of that product? And if we couldn't, then it's probably time to rethink whether we wanna produce that product because our markets are probably too far away from home or it's a low dollar value uh, product. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to make a living producing it. Okay, and so you do not need complicated software to do this, uh, do this tracking. In your first growing season, I recommend keeping just a simple sheet uh, uh, in your processing area, and you list all your crops, and then you don't have to do it all season, just like for three or four harvests, you write your, you log your start time, your finish time, and how many units came in. Okay, and that tells you the efficiency of your post-harvest processing. And which is the only, um, it's only, it's the only cost I'm now tracking because most of our time is spent in this, harvest, post-harvest, and, uh, and, and in our delivery too. Uh, it's a smaller proportion of time uh, to get the crop ready for harvest. And just about all of our crops require about the same amount of effort to get to the point where it's ready to harvest, okay? Our trellis crops are, especially our heirloom tomatoes, we're gonna to take a bit more effort. So we're gonna expect a little more out of them, but basically all of our crops, same amount of labor to get to the point of harvest. So there's no point in precisely tracking all of our costs with all of those. This is a very quick, quick method to get a sense for whether you're making money on your vegetables. Okay, so here's an example of lettuce. We might've started the clock at eight o'clock in the morning. And when she's finished, we'll ask, hey, how many heads of lettuce came, uh, came in? And we can quickly calculate, did we achieve $100 an hour? Okay, and this is the full list here. I'm not gonna go over, but you'll have it in the email. I'm gonna give you it tomorrow. And so we're going, to, we're going to focus on crops that percolate to the top of these lists of the metrics that we've chosen. Um, these are a couple of other metrics um, that I'm not necessarily gonna go over tonight, but uh, you can see the crops at the top of these lists 
And these are the ones that we're going to uh, want to, we want to offer these first to our chefs. We're not pushing them on our chefs. Um, however, we're going to uh, be very cautious uh, about growing something like a sugar snap peas on a, uh, on a large scale because we know we have a hard time uh, getting to that $100 uh, field of cooler time. So my third tip here is practicing hygienica, uh, which means load leveling. So three uh, Japanese terms come into play here. Uh, number, number one is mura. This means the unevenness of sales and production. Okay, so this means that your uh, example would be overworking yourself in July and August and then burning yourself out. So you don't have time or energy to, for winter, fall or winter production. Okay, uh, an example on a weekly basis might be stacking everything up so that you're doing all your harvest, most of your work at the end of the week, say for updates, to get ready for Saturday markets and Friday CSA pickups and that sort of thing. So you're totally worn out by the time Saturday market comes, comes around and you just barely can get up on Monday morning and go at it again. Okay, so what you want to do is spread your work like an accord in throughout the course of a week and throughout the course of a season. And so because what happens is mirror leads to mirror, which is a term for overburden. And when burden happens, that's when the waste, the mood is creeped in. Uh, that's when you're gonna plant too much because you don't have energy to precisely uh, plant. That's when defect happens and waiting waste and all these other wastes that I mentioned uh, will creep into the system. And so what we do is we put what we call a hijunga calendar to get there. Okay, we're not going to grow everything for every, every account every season. We're going to be selective and choose what's going to work for our farm, not just what works for uh, our accounts. And so what we have is I wanted everything to fit on one page, be as simple as possible. And so every week of the year, so it says one February, two February, three February, that means the third week of February, second week of February, first week of February. These are the crops that are going in and then the approximate locations. Um, and I'll talk about our crop map mapping system in a minute, but the approximate location those crops are going. And then we're gonna focus, we're gonna focus on producing when we're, most other farms are, are not even in business uh, or when they're packing up at the end of the growing season. And so uh, I, I, what I would recommend in your first one or two growing seasons is put yourself together a seeding calendar. And so what this means is keep track of when you seeded. So here for our baby greens, I track when we seeded, that's what the S stands for. Uh, T is when we, when we would have transplanted. And then I list all the dates of harvest down here. And here's uh, what I did for a couple of seasons to calculate. I wanted to have uh, February and March, I want to have, Baby greens at our markets during those two months because demand is super high those two months. No other farms are producing anything. And so this is what it takes. Okay, I know I've got to plant about the 24th of October if I want baby lettuce to be around in the first week of February. And spinach and, uh, is similar. And so the, it just takes a year or two, a season or two, to develop uh, your own particular seeding calendar. Every farm is, is in its own unique bioregion. And it, it, and there's some help out there too. You don't have to do it all on your own. And the best uh, seeding, seed planting calculator uh, that I know of is from the Johnny's um, webpage. And that's the link here. I, highly recommend, I would highly recommend uh, getting onto that seeding calendar, your first growing season, and uh, putting together a calendar that doesn't stress you, especially about so you're harvesting everything in July and August. That's a big problem I see on a lot of first and second year farms. And so here are some March radishes and turnips. We, could, we call ourselves a shoulder season farm because we actually put most of our emphasis on uh, March, April, May. That's when other farms are just gearing up. up and we're gonna take mountains of stuff into market. And then at the other end too, uh, we wanna have really heavy October, November, December markets because other farms are packing up, up and they, they leave a big opening in the marketplace. Okay, and so here's an example of how, I'll just throw a couple of pictures to show you how we do this in the greenhouse. We have a heated tunnel. Uh, we've got marsh tomatoes in here, and we're gonna uh, grow those turnips and radishes that uh, our workers were holding in the previous picture. We're gonna grow those between our rows of tomatoes. We're, we're heating that tunnel any, anyhow. And so why not use this space in there? And the paper pot transplanter is a wonderful tool uh, to make this happen efficiently. So here we're seeing uh, several hundred heads of romaine lettuces between a rows of tomatoes, you can see how the two are growing simultaneous until 
you see the remains are about ready to harvest at the point at which it's time to actually give up that aisle uh, because we're gonna need that, need that aisle space to, to harvest our tomatoes. Okay, so here are green beans. We're doing an April harvest of green beans on, being very creative to push the edges of our growing seasons. And here's a picture I took um, just yesterday, I think, of our greenhouse, uh, our greenhouse out, out here, uh, showing that we actually have stuff to offer around Christmas. And these are greens that we should have, you should be in perfect ready to harvest shape um, in about a month. By the time our February and March markets um, hit us, we'll, we should have a lot of greens for our, for our markets. And so we're going to focus on those seasons. And the Hajinka calendar, one page seeding calendar is the tip. Okay, so last tip is agility here, nimbleness. And so, like I mentioned, you want to perform this pool system planning two or three times throughout the year. And that's not, a, not just a one time uh, thing. And then use Kanban maps. And Kanban, a uh, term that means replacement signal. And essentially, uh, use Kanban maps to plan your crop rotation, uh, plan where crops are going to, to go, instead of locking yourself into multi year crop rotation maps. Okay. And so, essentially, the way this is going to work is I have beds here, they're about 68 feet in length. And when a bed opens, I'm gonna replace it, I'm gonna replenish it with whatever makes the most sense at that time, okay? I don't have a map that tells me precisely where every crop is going on the farm all year. You can do that. You can spend all winter creating spreadsheets and locking yourself in. Uh, however, the fact that I have the ability to be agile means that we can quickly pull crops, quickly plant another crop, and have our farmer at full capacity production. It's another lean principle that we've, we invest quite a bit in compost systems and high quality uh, growing soils. And so we wanna be using them whenever the sun is shining, whenever plants can produce photosynthesis, be, be doing photosynthesizing activities, we wanna be doing that. We wanna be using every square foot out here. And so what that means is we spent, we spent a lot of time developing quick methods for turning around crops, for pulling out one crop and, and putting another crop and here's a little 20 second uh, video here where there's spinach, winter spinach. And we're going to slice just underneath it, pull it up by hand. I've got a little 18 inch uh, walk behind here and a, uh, a little nine inch uh, mini. Or, and then uh, just a few minutes and we're gonna have some uh, basil uh, in the same place. Okay, so full capacity production. We're, we're not wasting uh, even an afternoon of sunlight hitting at this soil that we've invested so much money in. And if I were to lock myself into precise locations for, through multi-year crop planning, uh, then I'm gonna waste spaces and uh, not be nearly as efficient in my production. And so in reality, this is how it actually looks. I've got uh, the greenhouses that are listed here. And um, then look at field three. Uh, this just, um, tells you no more than the number of beds I project that I'll need in springtime of carrots. I need three. I don't need to know precisely where those carrots are going here. I just know I want three of them. And so as space opens, I'm gonna plant three. Or let's say uh, fall all, um, salad greens. So I know I want about five beds of fall salad greens uh, in this section of the farm uh, for our fall production. And so I don't care what are those five beds end up happening. Uh, maybe after tomatoes come out, after zucchinis come out, after the edamames come out, uh, or whatever, I'll plant one. Uh, and so that enables me to keep our farm at full capacity production, and so I can be as efficient as possible. Okay, then my last tip here is, is layer cake marketing. And uh, um, uh, I'll go out with this picture of this beautiful cake here to say that you want to plan not to sell. I told you how to plan and that you should expect these orders to come in. However, chefs are chefs. Restaurants are like sheep. Uh, they're, you can't predict uh, when they're gonna go under. And so you wanna actually expect uh, the worst to happen. So we never produce a crop for just one account, okay? I'm always expecting failure of that account, that restaurant to go under, that they're gonna change the menu or something. So I have a secondary account lined up and then a tertiary account lined up. So I have three 
um, three layers in my marketing layer cake. Uh, and every farm is going to be uh, have a different set of customers and, and going to work at this a little differently. Just to give you one example, is we have a Saturday farmers market, and so I do make projections what we'll sell throughout the year at a farmers market. However, let's say I have 50 pounds left for tomatoes from that Saturday farmers market. Uh, we pushed our CSA boxes uh, filling our CSA up to Mondays, and so we can have. Uh, CSA go through those leftover tomatoes that came home from market. They're still totally fine tomatoes. And that's our secondary market. If we didn't sell them at the farmer's market. And then uh, we have Monday afternoon restaurant deliveries. I can call up chefs <clears throat> and find someone usually willing to take those tomatoes if our, our farmer's market and our CSA customers have passed on those tomatoes. Uh, we'll have a third market for the tomatoes. Okay, so that's just one example. Uh, and in some cases, we'll have <clears throat> two or three restaurants who I know want the same product. And that's a great, uh, a great way to stack your markets to make sure you're moving everything you produce. Uh, like I said, the point is, and the point with all this planning is you want every effort to count. Every seed, cash, turns into cash, is the model that we have. Every seed should turn into cash. And if it hasn't, then there's waste along the line somewhere. And it, oftentimes, it's the waste of uh, overproduction, and we didn't plan precisely enough. So, okay, hey, that's my presentation. You guys have been awesome.